Good morning, everyone. I thought I might begin by saying a few words about the basic science and engineering initiative, the base of the Betty Irene Moore Children's Heart Center to put my introduction, <clears throat> excuse me, of Dr. Mark Schuyler Scott in context. It was almost five years ago when Dr. Hanley, our executive director and head of pediatric cardiovascular surgery came to me with a plan. He prefaced it by saying that although he and his colleagues in cardiac surgery and cardiology had developed and instituted over the past four decades life-saving procedures for children with congenital heart disease, we had not cured the condition, at least not for those with the most complex disorders. Children uh, uh, return for multiple procedures, and in later childhood and adulthood, they too frequently present with intractable arrhythmias and progressive heart failure, necessitating pacemakers and heart transplants. At least for the foreseeable future, he only envisioned incremental advances um, in the treatment of congenital heart disease. The real breakthroughs, he told me, were going to come from basic science and engineering. So he then said that he would try to raise the funds if I could find those individuals who could transform the care of children with heart disease. With a generous gift from the Moore family, we recruited together with the basic science and engineering departments at Stanford, remarkable individuals with expertise in genetics, cardiac development, and bioengineering. And we are currently in a search for the next cohort. The first scientist to be appointed is your grand round speaker, Dr. Mark Schuyler Scott. Dr. Scott is from the UK and did his undergraduate training at Cambridge, his PhD in protein bioprinting with Dr. Yannick at MIT, and his postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Jennifer Lewis at Harvard, where he brought bioprinting to new heights by cross-training in molecular biology with Dr. George Church. Mark and his team have made remarkable inroads into printing cardiac tissues that are vascularized, designing heart valves that could be printed via a catheter, and producing multicellular organoids. His work has been published in PNAS, Science and Nature Biotechnology. He is a newly appointed member of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub of investigators to add to his many awards and grants in joining the base. I should also mention that he's an ideal mentor and teacher, not only to graduate students and fellows, but he's also taken on high school students and their teachers and children with heart disease who join Camp Taylor, Taylor to help with the mission. I feel very privileged and delighted to introduce him to you this morning. His talk is entitled, The Long and Winding Road for 3D Printing of a Heart. Mark? Thank you, Marlene, for the, uh, the lovely introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share some of these, these steps uh, that we are working on towards uh, therapeutic scale tissue engineering. And I've titled it The Long and Winding Road to make it clear that there are a lot of steps uh, that, are, that are in the way between you know, our vision of, of organs on demand that are bioprinted and patient specific and where we are right now. But there is a road. And there's, you know, a winding road is one worth taking, and uh, we're, we're sort of taking steps along the way towards uh, achieving and uh, this sort of this sort of capability. So I joined the base about two years ago, um, that thanks to Marlene Rabinovich and her trust in sort of some of these ideas that I'm going to present to you today. Um, we're in a sort of an ideal position to be able to work with engineers at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, uh, and uh, work with them. Um, uh, clinicians over at the School of Medicine, uh, so I really couldn't be in a better spot to be able to to recruit, you know, this cross disciplinary team that's necessary to make this a reality. Uh, first, my my conflict of interest statement. Um, I do some consulting for 3D systems. I hold stock in Formlabs, 3D printing company. Um, some of our research is supported by Sartorius, which is a, a bio um, a bioreactor manufacturer. They provide in kind resources. Uh, I'm a, uh, a, a scientific advisor for Acoustica Bio, which does some drug formulation, uh, and some of my patents have been licensed by Tressel and Desktop Health. So, you know, the, the grand vision of the laboratory is to be able to solve some of these long-standing challenges in congenital heart defects. Uh, one example of these defects is hyperplastic left heart syndrome, where patients essentially only develop one functional ventricle. And you end up with a mixing of deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. And while this can be survived in, in utero, it, uh, the, the pro-oxygenation of blood that is 
passed systemically to the body because of the mixing results in end organ failure. And so over the last few decades, a series of, of surgical procedures have been developed that culminate in what's called the Fontan circulation, where you connect the inferior vena cava to the right pulmonary artery, and you essentially end up with, with instead of two parallel uh, 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 circulatory systems, you end up with one uh, network in series. And uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, while this can solve a lot of the blood mixing challenges, now the blood from the inferior vena cava will pass through the lungs before entering, uh, the single ventricle chamber, that single ventricle now needs to supply energy to both the, the systemic and uh, the pulmonary circulation. Uh, and as a result of that, you have this very large pressure uh, that builds up in this, the, the central venous pressure is too, too elevated and you end up uh, suffering from end organ failure, most notably liver fibrosis. Um, so what we want to do is, is to be able to supply energy uh, to this conduit uh, to be able to reduce that venous congestion, to increase um, the, the uh, perfusion to end organs. And also, if that uh, pump that we apply here is able to be pulsatile, then perhaps we could introduce pulsatility back to the right, um, the right side of circulation, which has been shown to potentially reduce the risk of uh, high pulmonary vascular resistance developing, uh, further improving the, the, the dynamics of the circuit. So if we want to manufacture a living conduit that's able to beat as if it's like an ectopic second ventricle, uh, the challenge is quite immense. So just looking at some of these, these calculations, this pump is going to have to be powered by cardiomyocytes, by living tissue. It's going to need a pair of valves to enable uh, uh, forward circulation, and it will need to generate about 10 millimeters of mercury to be able to supply sufficient uh, pressure to, to, uh, to sort of energize the right side of circulation. Now, if you take a look at the quality of the stem cell derived cardiomyocytes that, that the, the developmental biologists can produce right now, um, that basically translates into a 4.4 millimeter thick wall necessary uh, to generate enough force at the human scale uh, to, to produce 10 millimeters of mercury. That translates into 3 billion cells per conduit. And as, as soon as we're thicker than a few hundred microns, uh, those cells are going to need an intricate vascular network to sustain their viability. And we'll need this pair of, of valves to be able to ensure unidirectional flow. So this is an immense challenge. So before we sort of go deeper into uh, 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 you know, designing the systems we need to be able to manufacture this, uh, we're working with uh, Professor Alison Marsden uh, in bioengineering and mechanical engineering. We're working with uh, Professor Alison Marsden uh, to be able to perform uh, sort of computational modeling to make sure that if we were to produce this conduit, uh, it would truly uh, have enough energy to, to energize the right side of circulation. But the challenge lies in now manufacturing such uh, an extremely large, highly cellular, highly vascularized construct. And this really forms the, the kind of central mission of our laboratory. Uh, we're located in the basement of the Biomedical Innovations Building, just on uh, Pasteur Drive. And uh, our laboratory is powered by you know, really uh, advanced 3D printing technologies. Here you're seeing, uh, as we moved into our new laboratory, the uh, 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 riggers here moving in this 4.5 ton uh, 3D bioprinter, which sits at the heart of our lab, uh, to be able to, to manufacture tissues very rapidly with multiple materials and at scale. And we work with a lot of different uh, technologies. This is Frederick Solberg working in mechanical engineering. We have electrical engineers, bioengineers uh, that are working uh, towards this challenge. So the first thing we want to think about when it comes to manufacturing heart tissue is what are the core ingredients of a functioning myocardium? So First of all, we like to place vasculature at the very center of our work. And that's because as soon as you translate from a thin tissue to a thick myocardium, if you don't have the blood vessels in place, then you're simply not able to retain cell viability. And without cell viability, you're stuck at square zero um, and not able to sort of energize the, the cells and provide them with cues to mature and, and migrate and align. So vasculature really lies at the heart of our challenge. We need extracellular matrix to be able to, to bind the cells together and form a cohesive tissue. Of course, we need the cells. As we described before, we're going to need about 4 billion human cardiomyocytes for our challenge. 
all our assembly needs to occur at a human scale uh, to be able to perform human physiologic function. Uh, so the, the pump I showed you, it's about the size of uh, about the size of a fist. And not only does it need to be large, but when you dig deeper into the tissue, the microarchitecture needs to be present to supply the function uh, to the tissue. So focusing in on that first ingredient, the vasculature, it's a great example of just how complicated and multi-scale uh, human biology is. So if you look at the largest blood vessels like the aorta and the vena cava, right down to the tiniest, the capillaries, there's over four orders of magnitude difference in sizes, 10,000 fold different uh, in diameter. And in order to be able to efficiently perfuse tissue across large distances, but also supply blood to every single uh, cell, you really need this, this sort of distribution of major highways and small side roads. So these long and, and winding roads basically uh, are able to efficiently distribute um, uh, blood through long distances on the major highways, but then in the, with the presence of all the capillaries have the large surface area and be able to supply every cell uh, with their oxygen. So what do bioengineers have right now to be able to manufacture biology at all of these different length scales? There are many different methods of 3D bioprinting that have been developed over the past two decades. The first method of 3D bioprinting was uh, pioneered by Tom Boland in, in 2003. And essentially, he just used a, a, a simple inkjet printer like you use with, with, with printing on paper. But instead of printing a black ink, uh, he was depositing through nozzles. He was depositing droplets of cells mixed with gel. And he's able to basically create these maps, these sheets of cells uh, from an inkjet uh, printer. The problem with this method is that the ink that uh, forms these droplets needs to be very non-viscous. And so it spreads when it touches the surface and you end up with relatively flat geometry. So you can't build something that's very thick and, and, and you know, human scale with this process. So to make something thicker, you need to work with a thicker material. So instead of a very non-viscous ink, if you work with a viscoelastic material, that's a material that behaves like toothpaste and um, then you're able to build up thicker three-dimensional structures. So if you think about toothpaste, it's a pretty interesting material. It behaves like a solid when it's uh, uh, sitting on your toothbrush. You can hold your toothbrush upside down and it won't flow off. But when you squeeze the, the, the tube to extrude the, the material out of your, uh, onto your toothbrush, it flows like a liquid. So these viscoelastic materials behave in the region in between solid and liquid-like. And that allows us to extrude materials by squeezing them through a nozzle, they will flow. But once they're no longer feeling that force that's pushing them through the nozzle, uh, they will behave like a solid. Uh, and as a result, you can start building up three-dimensional structure. And the other nice thing about this process is if you think about traditional 3D printers that you may have seen before that are printing plastic filaments, these need to heat the plastic to around 100 degrees centigrade to melt the plastic. And obviously this would be a very bad thing to do to human cells. Uh, and so this can work at room temperature or at four degrees, it's very cell friendly. With this process, you can build up much more three-dimensional structures on the orders of centimeters thick. You can work at resolutions on the order of hundred microns, that's about the width of a human hair. You can build um, multiple materials by coming in with different nozzles and printing different materials. So if you need to print some extracellular matrix here, some cell A there, cell B there, introduce some vasculature here, then you're able to load different materials into your printer uh, to be able to manufacture those complex tissues. Other methods include stereolithography, where you use patterns of light to produce a 3D structure. You have a liquid bath that upon exposure to light turns solid. And by using a projector, you can shape the pattern with each layer that turns solid and over time build up a 3D structure. This is a really cool technology for resolution. You can get you know, higher resolutions approaching single cell resolution and at larger scales on the order of centimeters. But a huge challenge in this field is to get multi-material printing because you're stuck printing from a single bath of material. It's very hard to get multiple classes of materials co-introduced into a structure. At the highest resolution, you can turn to two photon fabrication. Uh, in this process, uh, you use a focused pulsed femtosecond laser, which is able to produce uh, polymerization of a material only at the focus. Uh, and by using sort of really high resolution optics, you can make truly intricate three-dimensional structures. Uh, this is sort of the, the canonical example in the field is with this micro bull printer. This is a two micron scale bar, so it's about 10 microns across. Uh, just to show you the real level of finesse that you can manufacture 
um, uh, components using two photon fabrication. So, you know, if, if you want to think about making capillaries, two photon fabrication makes sense. To make larger vessels, filament extrusion may, may, may make more sense. But if you look at the scale, there's a scale resolution trade off. The highest resolution processes, like, like two photon fabrication, that manufacturers with one, mes one micron resolution can only print things at, at millimeter scale and fall short of that, that physiologic, therapeutically relevant length scale. So we're trying to build a, a biofabrication pipeline that is working towards whole organ engineering. And in order to solve this, we don't just need the bioprinting, we need the cells. Uh, the typical scientist will work with millions of cells in a petri dish, but we need billions to trillions of cells in our organs that we print. And the whole market is just not designed to take that many cells. The pricing of stem cell media at around $500 per liter would result in a cost of millions of dollars per week to be able to con con sort of manufacture sufficient stem cells. So we need ways of making stem cells more efficiently. We need to uh, put them together into building blocks that can self-assemble at the small scale. And we need to be able to then work with these building blocks to manufacture larger scale tissues that we can then introduce vasculature as we start getting larger, we have to bring in the oxygen. And we need to do this with new hardware technologies that can manufacture things fast enough. It's all very well being able to manufacture an organ at scale, but if you aren't able to do so in the time that the cells can survive in your printer, then you're, you're again still stuck at square zero where your cells all die. Uh, so this sort of forms the, the hub of the lab. We're working on synthetic and organoid engineering to be able to manufacture uh, multicellular tissues. Uh, this is our latest work just accepted three weeks ago uh, and should be coming out shortly on manufacturing synthetic organoids using genetic engineering to make cells and organoids much more efficiently and at much larger scale. But these organoids, they're, you know, they're a, a grain of couscous. They're about a millimeter in diameter, far from the, the scale we need for a thick and refusing pump to be able to energize that right-sided circulation. And so we compile hundreds of thousands of these together to be able to manufacture larger scale tissues that over time each of those building blocks fuse uh, into a contiguous tissue that we can perfuse through the printed vasculature. And we're working on new 3D bioprinting technologies that can assemble tissues now that we have the cells, that we have the organoids, to be able to manufacture tissues at larger scale faster so that we can finish the tissue and get it perfusing fast enough to keep those cells alive. This is the overview of the lab, and we're going to take a dive now into some of these technologies in greater detail. So let's think about the challenge of manufacturing a solid organ, something like the heart or the liver or the kidney. So unlike uh, connective tissues, solid organs are enormously cellular. You're looking at between 10 and 100 billion cells per organ. And if you look at typical histologies of liver, heart, kidney, almost all of the volume of an organ is cellular. There's relatively little extracellular space. It's almost all cells. So we need very densely cellular bioinks. If we're printing, it needs to be mainly cell matter that we're printing with a little bit of you know, extracellular matrix and glue. And when those cells are printed, we need to manufacture a complexity of multiple length scales from the tens of centimeters down to the single micron. And all of those cells, those hundreds of billions of cells need to be perfused by this densely vascular network. Now, over the past decade, a number of technologies are converging that are sort of elucidating a pathway towards manufacturing solid organs. iPSCs and CRISPR, iPSCs are uh, patient-specific stem cells that can be derived from the blood draw, allow us to be able to source patient-specific cell types uh, in essentially a limitless capacity, so long as we have the money to produce that many cells that we need for an organ. CRISPR allows us to potentially correct mutations that cause some of the defects in the patient tissue in the first place. We're able to take stem cells, and instead of growing them in 2D on a, on a plastic substrate, we can grow them in 3D and then coax them gently to form these different native tissue-like architectures. Our cells, of course, have been programmed to know how to manufacture uh, organ-like tissues and can self-assemble remarkable structures through angiogenesis here in the kidney. You can see all the vasculature wrapping around these primitive glomerular structures that are forming uh, in this kidney organoid. So we don't necessarily need to print every part of the organ. We can let the biology do 
the work at the small scale, if we use these building blocks that have that complexity embedded within them that is self-assembled, and now just work at understanding how we can put these building blocks together to manufacture a therapeutic scale tissue that we're able to keep alive through perfusion. And the this is where the last technology, 3D bioprinting, is really shining. So there's this process called embedded 3D printing, where instead of printing layer by layer that you may think of with a normal 3D printing process, we're actually able to extrude one material inside a gel of a second material. And what that lets us do is write very biomimetic, very freeform structures very rapidly uh, in 3D space using very soft materials. This material that I'm printing has a consistency like toothpaste. If that tree were printed with toothpaste in midair, it would simply flop over. But in embedded printing, I can write these soft materials uh, freely and they will be held in place uh, by that gel. Now that gel I showed you was just hair gel. It's a transparent material that has that liquid solid like uh, a material property. But along with my colleague, Sebastian Uzel uh, at Harvard, we wanted to ask, are we able to recapitulate that, that liquid solid like behavior just in a densely compacted pellet of living human stem cells? So we formed hundreds of thousands of little stem cell aggregates, about 2000 cells per little sphere. These are again, they're like little tiny grains of couscous and we centrifuge these down to form a pellet. Any of you that have worked in a wet lab know that when you centrifuge, you typically form a pellet that's you know, tiny. You kind of stare at the bottom of your tube and may find a little piece of white. Well, at our scale, we actually end up with milliliters of pellet and we can extrude it onto this machine that measures its material properties. It's called a rheometer. And we find that it, this material has a toothpaste-like characteristic. You can see this sort of a a bump there that if this were just liquid, it would form a, a smooth semicircle. But because there's a little bit of stiffness in this material, it can hold a little bit of shape. And that's crucial for this embedded 3D printing process. We find that this material is both shear thinning and viscoelastic, which is ideal uh, for our printing process. So let's take a look up close what this looks like. As we uh, translate a 3D printer nozzle, you're looking underneath a nozzle here. Uh, of a 3D printer, these embryoid bodies, these aggregates of stem cells are able to move out the way and reheal behind that nozzle. But if this nozzle is extruding material, then it's able to push the cells out the way and hold them out of the way so that we can essentially create a channel through which we can introduce oxygen and nutrients into this densely cellular tissue. And by changing the extrusion rate of the printer, uh, we're able to select the diameter of the vessels that we can print. And we can print not just one, but many branching vessels. So here, starting from one vessel, branching into two, four, eight, 16, and back down to one, we can have a single inlet and a single outlet through which we can now attach a pump to the left and an outlet to the right and perfuse oxygenated media through this dense and thick tissue. If I took this densely cellular tissue here and just placed it in a bath, only the outer 500 to 800 microns of tissue remains viable, shown here in green. But if I'm able to produce vasculature and perfuse oxygen and nutrients, not only around the outside, but through the core of the tissue, I'm now able to keep thick tissue viable and alive. And this is really something that 3D bioprinting has, is changing in tissue engineering. In the past, we've been limited to thin tissues, and now we can go 3D. It's really you know, changing the scale at which we can work. So what I showed you before were just stem cells. We don't have a, a pluripotent stem cell organ in our bodies. We have to differentiate them to create useful uh, tissues. So these were embryo bodies. You can create the vessels. But this process works with any of these sort of three-dimensional aggregates of tissue called organoids. Uh, here I've shown with, with cerebral organoids, we can kind of introduce channels into them. Uh, with cardiac spheroids, we can introduce channels into them. So let's take a deeper look now uh, at the cardiac space. So if we want to manufacture therapeutic scale tissue, we need to be able to produce very large quantities of uh, cardiac organoids. So we grow these, these pluripotent stem cells and we put them through this series of, of uh, developmental stages to produce uh, living and beating cardiac organoids that are about 80% cardiomyocytes and about 20% of the remaining cells. Um, of the remaining cells are mainly stromal, like fibroblast-like cells. And these cells, if you look at them under the microscope, you can see them jiggling around here, they beat independently, which you know it looks super 
still never gets dull looking down a microscope and watching these little pieces of tissue beating. Now that's all very well and, and we compile them together to form a tissue, but if those aggregates can't talk to each other and they're beating independently, we're not going to get a synchronous beat. So we wanted to see what happens if we culture these long term when we cram them together. Do they start talking to each other? So we form a little disk of tissue here made up of hundreds of these little beating spheroids. And on day one, there's not much motion occurring and the motion is relatively asynchronous. But by day 10 in culture, you can see that they've started to fuse together and the beating is now more synchronous. So we're able to essentially work with many of these independent little tissues, craft them and assemble them with vasculature and then have them fuse to form a beating tissue over time. So let's look at that process. We're able to write these blood vessels into the depth of that tissue by virtue of its viscoelastic property. We're able to then flush out that red material I printed to produce channels that we can flush media through and oxygenated media. And after 16 days in perfusion, this tissue is now beating visibly across the room. This is a centimeter tall. Uh, and you know, we're able to supply the depth of that tissue with oxygen. We're able to see some sarcomeric maturation. We're able to align the tissue because it's growing between these two uh, spring-like structures. It's basically behaving like a gem. It's training the, the tissue to kind of beat uh, in that axis. And we can test drugs on this tissue by perfusing them through the vasculature and having a look at the effect on the beat rate and beat amplitude. So this is when a reviewer, when you submit your paper, says, well, that's a lot of work to go through to make you know, a simple branched vessel. And here we want to remind people that the grand vision of this is you can print arbitrary branched vasculature into uh, a densely compacted cardiac tissue. And so uh, we sort of took a wedge of a patient-specific model here from the NIH 3D print exchange. And we, we formed sort of a wedge, filled it with compacted uh, cardiac organoids, and we were able to reproduce these um, uh, main uh, uh, coronary arteries and some of the septal branches and diagonal branches uh, uh, using this 3D printing process. So these vessels here, they're on the order of a millimeter, 0.5 to one millimeter in diameter. These really constitute the highways that we were talking about. And every cardiomyocyte in the body has its own capillary next to it that is supplying it with oxygen much more closely than a large vessel can that's further away. And so we also work on techniques using lasers to be able to manufacture uh, vessels at very small scale. And I want to show you some of this two photon, this laser based approach, and how that allows us to write vessels instead of at the, the millimeter scale at the, the, the micron scale. So in one photon excitation, you basically are shining a blue light through something that, it, that absorbs blue you'll find as you focus it up through an, uh, a media containing as something that absorbs the energy, a fluorophore, that it excites on all planes. So this is our thickness here in Z, up, down, and you can see that we have green on all layers. If I wanted to steer this beam around in 3D, the reaction would be occurring on all layers at once, and we wouldn't be able to write something in 3D. But with two photon excitation, you supply not blue light, but red light, uh, with half the energy necessary per photon as the blue light. And now two photons can be simultaneously captured to behave as if a, a blue photon were absorbed. In order for that to occur, you need these, these photons to be at a very high intensity. And the reaction rate is going to be proportional to the intensity squared. Now, because the intensity increases as you get towards the, the focus, the intensity squared increases dramatically as you move towards the focus. So now we only really have a reaction occurring at the focal point. And by steering this focal point now around in 3D, we're able to produce a 3D structure. So we built a two photon uh, a microscope uh, that's able to uh, not image, but actually write uh, uh, three dimensional structures. And we found that if we took collagen, that's a, a filamentary gel that's present in our body, the most abundant protein in our body, if we were to uh, expose this to the two photon light and then put it in a weak acid, then the regions that are exposed remain and the regions unexposed dissolve away. And by doing this, we can essentially expose a, a volume of our pattern to this focused laser light and then stick it in a weak uh, base or acid uh, to be able to dissolve away and, and uh, develop our structure like developing a photograph. So what you're seeing here is a video of, my, of, of 
multi-photon microfabrication, and you're looking at laser scanning in real time. So here we have a laser spot that's scanning very rapidly. We have trunks, tusks, ears um, being produced. It's, it's printing 17 layers per second, a very rapid scanning process. And after leaving it in uh, uh, acid for a, a small amount of time, the, the pattern starts to appear. Over more time, you can see that we've now exposed and developed this very high resolution 3D structure made out of native fibrillar collagen. So just looking at the resolutions we can create in collagen, this is a 33 micron by 80 micron elephant, uh, one of my favorite animals uh, growing up. It's also got lots of features which shows off the, the kind of resolution and complexity that we can build. But if we want to do something more useful than 3D printing elephants, uh, this is an ideal system for printing uh, capillary networks. So we have a microfluidic chip with an inlet and an outlet, and we can come in and fill the gap in between with a block of collagen. So now nothing can flow from left to right. It's filled with a, with a gel. But we can then write a series of channels into this gel so that we now are able to flow media from left to right through this series of channels. And we can use this to introduce blood vessel cells like endothelial cells into the printed vasculature. So this is what it looks like when we seed the cells. You can see them all round and bowled up and just as we introduce them. And over the course of 24 hours, they stick to the collagen wall. They love collagen, they stick to it, and they start to form these lumens uh, that we can perfuse. So just looking at cross sections, you can see we're now able to write channel structures that are on the order of 50 microns or below into these gels. And just looking at a 3D rendering, uh, of these endothelial cells in a printed vessel, and you can see, you can look right the way through these lumens. We can work at even higher resolution and with more complex geometries with capillaries passing over and under, you know, working right down at the 10, 20 micron scale. So this is a really exciting technology to manufacture capillaries. And we're looking at ways we can combine this approach to print capillaries with the other approaches to print the larger scale vessels. Are we able to get this truly you know, a artery to capillary to vent to vein sort of network produced uh, in, a, in a sort of contiguous process. So this is uh, a lot of our work in vascularizing tissues to maintain them uh, viable. I want to talk a little bit about this uh, synthetic organoid approach uh, for us to be able to manufacture lots of cells. So we, I think right now we, we have some good bioprinting te uh, techniques that we're ready to start practicing printing at scale, but you have no idea how much it costs and how much blood and sweat goes into manufacturing this many organoids to do a single cellular print. We simply need to make organoids more efficiently, more cheaply, more rapidly. Um, and that's where the synthetic organoid engineering comes in. So organoids are you know, these very exciting uh, uh, aggregates of tissue derived from a stem cell uh, that can self-assemble beautiful architectures. Here you're looking at work I, I did with Kim Kimberly Homan, um, uh, where we took two uh, vascularized kidney organoids that we developed, put them next to each other, and you can see them communicating. Their blood vessels are growing between them. These little building blocks of tissue want to talk to each other, and we didn't have to print every one of these capillaries. They self-assembled. Uh, which is much more scalable and, and rapid and easy than having to you know, position every cell. And there are cerebral organoids and skin organoids. It's just many different types of, of tissues you can create organoids out of now. So these building blocks are you know, very broadly applicable. And it's generally understood that if you want more cell types in an organoid to get more complexity, you have to give it less specific cues. The whole field of stem cell differentiation was kind of derived on the idea of I want that cell type and very efficiently. So people have concocted all these you know, stages of cues to produce a cell type very specifically. To create an organoid, we have to kind of unwind all of that and think, well, how do I give a gentle cue to the cells to kind of say, go you know, cerebral, go brain, but not too specifically. Um, because if you go too specifically, then I generate you know, a single uh, cell type. And so uh, by giving just a minimal media to the cells, you're able to um, produce multiple cell types, but at the same time, you're giving it very little instruction. And so you have very little homogeneity. So while you can create lots of different cell types, you have very little control over, well, exactly what cell types you have and it's, it's tissue patterning. And so there's this trade-off between the kind of complexities you can produce with the number of cell types, but also 
how reproducible and how homogeneous your, your organoids uh, will end up being. So this is sort of a, a long understood um, balance in the organoid field uh, that makes it very challenging to create something complex and at scale and robustly. So we wanted to ask, well, what if we had multiple types of stem cells with each stem cell genetically engineered to become a specific cell type, but we mix these cell types together into an aggregate. But now, now each cell is receiving a very specific cue to become a specific cell type. But there are multiple populations of cells that are receiving different cues and they differentiate in orthogonal in, in, in right angle directions to different cell types all at the same time in situ. So if this sort of process could work, then we'd be able to pull these together into those embryo bodies, those little aggregates you saw, and differentiate them using multiple transcription factors into multicellular tissue, a one-step process to produce multicellular tissue very accurately and reproducibly. Even crazier, instead of just randomly mixing them, if we were able to pattern these stem cells in a way that produced more native-like architectures and differentiate them, are we able to produce multicellular tissues with more precise architectures? And of course, the best way of us to pattern them is to use bioprinting. Are we able to bioprint these stem cells uh, and then differentiate them to produce, sort of develop um, these multicellular tissues with defined patterns? So let's take a look at, at what this process looks like. Here is a wild-type stem cell, uh, which we've used to, um, uh, as, as a model, um, we've used uh, development of neural progenitor cells. So the media we are growing these cells in is telling the cells to become neural progenitor cells. We have inducible endothelial cells and we have inducible neurons. These inducible cells upregulate a transcription factor upon adding doxycycline to form endothelial cells and neurons respectively. So if I take my wild type cells, whether or not I have this inducing agent, these aren't genetically engineered. So they don't listen to the doxycycline and they form these beautiful neural rosettes as one would expect because the media is instructing them to become neural stem cells. Now we wanted to ask what happens if we tell them from the media to become neural stem cells, but override them with doxycycline from the inside, upregulate transcription factors that tell them to become endothelium. And when we do this, you can see that we just get this dramatically different um, phenotype from our cells. So in the absence of doxycycline, we form neural stem cells. In the presence of doxycycline, we form endothelium. And not just form a few of them, but it's near 100% efficiency one way or the other. So this is very sort of orthogonal, independent behavior that by intracellularly rewiring cells, we're able to completely circumvent uh, the media condition that those cells are grown in which is really important because these aggregates can only be grown in one medium. And I want these cells to become multiple cell types, even though they can only sit in one medium. So this intracellular wiring here for neurons also overrides the medium and forms neural cells instead of neural stem cells. Looking at what this process looks like uh, under the microscope of time, we have here uh, well type cells in green, inducible endothelial cells in red that we're imaging over the course of six days. And you can see the neural stem cells form these neurospheres, which is a very typical behavior when they're grown on matrigel. And the endothelial cells starts forming these sort of vascular-like networks uh, uh, between these neural, uh, neurospheres. This doesn't work just with in, in this neural stem cell forming medium, we've actually shown orthogonal differentiation when growing in vascular development medium. So we try and tell the well type cells to become endothelial cells, absence and presence of doxy form endothelial cells. But if we have these inducible neuron cells and add doxycycline, instead of forming endothelial cells, they form neurons. Now we can combine these different cell types together to form vascularized organoids. We're able to dope in a certain percentage of cells that will become endothelium in the organoids. So by, uh, if we have just wild type cells and tell them to become a cerebral organoid, we have neural tissue, um, but this is, uh, doesn't contain any endothelium. Conversely, if we have 33% um, uh, of the cells be upregulating ETB2, then when we develop these after 10 days, you can see a dense plexus of vasculature that runs through these organoids. And if these organoids are implanted in a gel, an extracellular matrix, those endothelium start sprouting and, uh, through angiogenesis and sort of this beautiful sort of hairy microvascular network. 
We do some single cell RNA sequencing to have a look at the effects this has on, on development. The most notable is that you really don't, don't get many endothelium at all in the absence of and um, it with wild type only cells. Um, but if we use um, these uh, inducible endothelial cells, you start getting these beautiful endothelial cell populations appearing. So we can not only create aggregates, but we can actually bioprint the pattern of cells uh, to then add doxycycline and develop the underlying genetically engineered pattern. So here we are printing some arbitrary structure uh, with this very dense IPSC ink, pluripotent stem cell ink. The cells survive the printing process very well. We have higher viabilities around 90%. We can write with around 50 micron resolution. And now depending on the cell type we print, they either form, if they're wild type, they form these uh, uh, dense neural epithelium here. If they are inducible endothelial cells, they form these sprouting vascular networks in the pattern. And if they're inducible neurons, they form um, these dense sort of filaments, neur neuron filaments, uh, with axons here growing out uh, from, from these filaments. Just looking in 3D, you can see the beautiful sort of structure of all these growing axons in 3D. Now, instead of printing one cell type, we can actually print patterns of three cell types by using this special 3D printed 3D printer nozzle. Uh, we're able to extrude the wild type, inducible endothelium, and inducible neurons together to form sort of an aquafesh, sort of, sort of a multi-material filament coming out of the printer. And what you see is on day zero, we can pattern these three cell types. Now, if I stain this for OCT4 for pluripotency, all you would see is, yes, this is, these are all just pluripotent stem cells, but hidden in the pattern of cells, the different cell types overexpress different transcription factors. When I add doxycycline and wait six days, you can see the pattern, this multi-layer pattern arise, emerge, because the underlying cell uh, pattern that overexpresses different transcription factors has been kind of encoded in the printing and that the tissue architecture is maintained when you differentiate those cells. So what I, I'm showing you this for is that we're able to program the cellular composition, increase the efficiency of the differentiation of multicellular organoids uh, and introduce vasculature at the micro scale so that we can come in with our other printing methods and produce vessels that hook up to those micro vessels and keep that tissue alive so that we can build sort of thicker and more cellular tissues on demand. So that's the kind of three uh, areas. Just going to show you a very quick little uh, example here of the, the bioprinting technology uh, methods. We're working with uh, Professor Okamura and Max Schwager, um, and they uh, are in uh, uh, mechanical engineering and aeroastro. Uh, and they have a really cool robotic print head that instead of you know being a rigid print head moving on a big gantry in 3D, their, ro their, their, their uh, robots are able to behave kind of like a um, like a, a whipping tentacle. Uh, so instead of moving the whole printer, what if we could just kind of steer the print head? Would this be a quicker and more versatile way of 3D printing? And in particular, could we use this through a catheter, since it's coming through a keyhole, to be able to perform printing in situ inside the body? So I just want to show you a couple of videos here with this process. You can see this print head is able to snake and slither around and find its way into sort of tight spaces, but move very, very accurately in 3D space. And if we perform embedded printing using this by extruding a material as it's going, we're able to essentially manufacture a complex three-dimensional structure, but coming through a keyhole. So we're very excited about sort of applications of new methods of printing to be able to write in difficult to access locations in the body. So I think uh, we've covered a fair bit of ground. I hope uh, I've shown you that there is a pipeline uh, you know, that we're, we're building towards to make a lot of cells, make a lot of organoids, assemble organoids, put in vasculature, allow those organoids to fuse, keep the cells alive, train them with some springs, create thick tissue that you know, we're aiming towards manufacturing replacement heart tissue for children with congenital heart defects. This work was done, and um, so a lot of my work I showed is from my postdoc in Jennifer Lewis's lab, I'd like to highlight Sebastian Uzel that I did the embedded 3D printing in, in organoids with. Uh, here in the Skylar Scott lab, I showed uh, some of the work by Jesse Herman and uh, Jonathan Weiss and, and, and Stacey Lee. I'd like to thank uh, um, Debbie and Josh and Frederick and Soham and, and Vincent for all their work um, that I showed here today. 
We're funded through additional ventures, uh, which is a really exciting private um, uh, donor that is, is seeking to manufacture solutions for children with single ventricle disease. Uh, and we're also funded by MCHRI, the Chan Zuckerberg, Stanford CVI, and the Baxter Foundation and the Alternatives Research and Development Foundation. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. That was spectacular, Mark. And, and we do have questions already in the uh, Q&A and chat. So Sahar wants to know if you can speak to how doxycycline leads to differentiation. Are there other substances that can be used? Uh, do they function differently to achieve the same end of turning on, on and off genes? So doxycycline doesn't work through a traditional small molecule that you add to media that may you know, inhibit a receptor to alter a pathway. Um, the, the doxycycline actually induces uh, gene upregulation. So we have um, a system with TET-R, it's a, it's a TET responsive element um, that is able to, this is TET on protein binds doxycycline and then that doxycycline TET on protein works like a, promote, a, a transcription factor that binds to a promoter and is able to, uh, to uh, activate the, uh, the expression of genes. So we, we upregulate um, uh, 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 the genes through doxycycline addition. We chose uh, uh, ETB2, which has been shown in the literature to drive endothelial differentiation and NGN1 to drive neuron differentiation. And so if we mix those two cell types, you get both endothelium and neurons. Now, right now, because both cues are under doxycycline, we add dox to the media, they both start differentiating at the same time. We're pretty excited about the idea of having orthogonal inducing agents. So instead of using just doxycycline, there are other systems with other small molecules that you add to upregulate genes. Most notably are Qmate and um, uh, estrogen. It's an estrogen receptor uh, uh, system. So uh, we'd be able to uh, sort of upregulate, you know, at different time points, different genes to be able to produce more complex tissue. That's great. Thanks, Mark. And uh, Chris Arakawa has a uh, really great talk, Mark. I was wondering if you're able to endothelialize those extrusion-based vessels, and if so, if you've noticed a benefit from having the endothelial cells there, uh, direct or paracrine signaling to align the cardiomyocytes and enhance maturity. And then he also wants to know what specific materials you've utilized for the extrusion materials. Have you considered coaxial techniques? That's a uh... Definitely someone with uh, the, the coaxial extrusion techniques is so someone that knows their bioprinting, which is great. Um, so talking about endothelialization, when we work with these small vessels, these capillaries, we're able to endothelialize these well because the endothelial cells stick really nicely uh, to, the, um, uh, to the underlying collagen. When we're working with these um, uh, extrusion systems with organoids, uh, we have been able to get regions because these organoids have gel in between them, we get regions of good endothelialization when we perfuse endothelial cells into these lumens. But sometimes these organoids, because they're bumpy, they kind of sort of protrude out. And we found that it's quite hard to endothelialize the surface of these organoids. So far, we've tried adding agents to increase the adhesion of endothelial cells like basement membrane, mem you know, matrigel uh, or fibronectin uh, to try and sort of pre-coat these organoids but it's, it's a little tricky to get them endothelializing well. I think we'll need to perfuse extra gel through these to make it even stickier for, um, uh, for the endothelial cells. In order to practice that, we need a lot more cells. The amount of headache that went into producing even one of these tissues was just too much. So we're focusing on upscaling cells and we can't wait to start practicing those materials. Now, coaxial extrusion could be a good way to do that, where you could imagine a core that contains endothelial cells and a, a outside that contains a, a gel rich region that when you melt the whole coaxially printed uh, filament, the, um, the gel around the outside forms a nice gel layer and the endothelial cells kind of sort of start freely floating and can stick to the walls um, uh, of, the, of the process. So we'd love to try that with a, a, a dual extrusion system. That's great. And Ed Leibowitz says, this is the most amazing lecture I've ever heard. Well, thanks. Um, yet, so please don't walk away from this and think it's easy. We've got a heart. Thank you. And um, and then we have another question. Uh, if you take away the docs, do the epi um, epithelial cells, endothelial cells, do the cells begin to de-differentiate 
Uh, that was a question. Well, that, that's a very good question. Um, we haven't found that. So when we upregulate ETB2, you get a very naive endothelial cell. Um, and then depending on the conditions you supply to it and the shear stress, then you're able to mature it further. People have shown that if you grow these ETB2 differentiated cells in the presence of other cardiac-like stem cells, that you're able to give them a more cardiac endothelial cell-like uh, uh, phenotype. And so I don't think that we get a de-differentiation so long as we give it the correct cue. And that's kind of the case for any stem cell-derived cell type, that you can differentiate it with all these series of cocktails, but if you if you kind of don't keep it in the right niche and give it the right physical cues and the right chemical cues, then they can start to de-differentiate in culture. So that's something that you know we need to practice. We need to mature the cells more and we need to have them in the right niche at the right density in the right condition. And in order to do that, we need more cells. It's kind of the end of every sentence of mine is going to be, we need more cells. <laughs> well, James Dunn is even more challenging because he wants to know if you've printed these structures already in animals. So. <laughs> Yes, they're humanized animals. So we haven't put a, a, a macro vascularized tissue into an animal yet, but working with Chris Chen when we were at Harvard, we took one of these printed cardiac tissues and, um, and were able to implant it into a fat pad where it robustly microvascularized. But this was a thin disc that was on the order of a millimeter thick. So we know that vascular invasion can work well over the short scale, short distance scale. But if you're asking it to vascularize deeper, you'll end up with core necrosis before you're able to vascularize. And we did see a bit of that. So we got robust vascularization around the outer, maybe two, 300 microns. And then the inside just kind of looked like some kind of goo. <laughs> it was all just uh, uh, necrotic cells due to, uh, to um, uh, inadequate perfusion. Yeah. And our new postdoc, uh, Cheng Yang Zhang, wants to know how you get around from the fact that you're using human cells, but some of the materials you use may be animal materials like fetal bovine serum. And when you consider moving this into a human, uh, can you use all human type of materials? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in our laboratory, our favorite material now is fibrinogen, it's fibrin. And one of the reasons we really like it is it's very remodelable. You, you know, it's part of the wound healing process that cells have sort of evolved to be able to adhere to fiber and remodel it and produce their own native matrix. And the other really exciting reason we use fibrinogen is in the future, you'd be able to derive fibrinogen from a patient blood draw. So if you took just around 500 milliliters of blood and the, the concentration of fibrinogen in the blood is around 50 mg per mil, um, which is quite high. And it's, you wouldn't need too much blood to be able to get a sufficient ECM material that's patient specific. So then you can work with patient specific cells patient-specific ECM. In terms of serum, we stay far away from serum. And um, so it's, it's, it's too undefined for our differentiation needs. Well, that's great. And um, that's the end of the questions that I see in the chat, but I'm sure everyone's spellbound as, as I am. Every time I hear this, it's just spectacular work. So uh, I'm sure if you have questions from the audience uh, uh, and you'd like to email Mark directly, he'd be more than happy to answer them and uh, give you a tour of the lab. It's really eye-opening to the future of uh, uh, pediatric cardiovascular um, you know, treatments. Uh, and cures for our children. So uh, thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for joining our team. And, and thanks, everyone, for your attention. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.